Good to be with you again. <clears throat> this week we will be beginning the annual week of prayer for Christian unity. I guess one of my big items I look forward to each year. It was a Paul Watson many years ago in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, a native of the Eastern Shore of Maryland in our own diocese. He was an Episcopalian and he joined with a number of other Episcopalians to form a religious community at Graymoor in New York. And the big thing was to pray for Christian unity. And they began to observe this week beginning with January 18th until the 25th, which is the feast day of the conversion of St. Paul the Apostle. And sure enough, their prayers were answered. They themselves became members of the Catholic Church. And so that devotion of prayer for Christian unity has spread throughout the world and many Christians will enter into that prayer. I think at times, you know, we get used to certain things in life. All our lives we've seen churches, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Orthodox, Catholic, and we just assume, well, that's the way it always is. And I'm sure many, many non-Catholics think that's the way it always is. But no, that isn't the way it is or should be. And we know especially Jesus at the Last Supper, praying for all of us. And especially in the 17th chapter of St. John's Gospel, we hear Jesus praying for all of us through the centuries who would come to believe in him. And above all else, he prayed that we would be one, united, one in faith and love. When people are about to die, they don't talk about trivial things. They talk about what was most important to them. And so the fact that the, almost the last words we have of Jesus before he went to the cross, he's praying for all of us. That always impressed me, I guess, to think that Jesus Christ, before he suffered and died on a cross and rose, was praying for you and me, for all of us. He could see all of us coming through the centuries who would believe in him and praying above all else that we would be united. Let me again read his words from that 17th chapter where Jesus is praying to the Father and it's almost as if we're listening to someone talking on a telephone to someone. He's talking to the Father and we're listening in. And he prayed. Lifting up his eyes to heaven, Jesus prayed, saying, Holy Father, I pray not only for them, but for all those who will believe in me through their word, through the apostles' word so that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me that they may be brought to perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them even as you loved me. Father, they are your gift to me. I wish that where I am, they also may be with me, that they may see my glory that you gave me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. I made known to them your name, and I will make it known that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. 
I, I find those words very powerful to think that Jesus, before he entered into his passion, was praying for all of us, speaking of us as the Father's gift to him, and that we are so closely united with him. Through the gift of faith that you and I have received, and above all through our baptism into his body, we are one with Jesus. And he called us over and over again in the Gospels to love one another. And as he said, this will be a sign to the whole world that I am with you. Your love for one another, your unity. Jesus knew very well, it, it's so much a part of human life that we can have disagreements and, and they can lead to ruptures of relationships and, and antagonism, conflicts. And to overcome all that is a real challenge. But that's a challenge before us as Christians. And he said, this is the world, how the world will know that I am with you. That your unity will be a sign to them that something very special is happening here. I read these, uh, this week we've returned to ordinary time of the year and for four weeks we are reading from the letter to the Hebrews. And I was surprised, I always look at a commentary by a very noted a Protestant scripture scholar. And I was surprised to read him say, oh, this letter to the Hebrews is one of the least appreciated, one of the least liked of all the scriptures. And I thought, I love the letter to the Hebrews. Oh, how can he be saying this? And he talked about how, well, there's so many references to the Jewish worship, the worship in the temple in Jerusalem. And yeah, the author, whoever he is, we don't know who the author is. Uh, some said Paul, but no, the, the Greek of this letter is very different from the Greek of all the other letters attributed to St. Paul. The way he quotes scripture and everything is very different. But whoever that inspired author is, he was using all that had happened in the Old Testament, and above all, it's worship, to see it fulfilled in Jesus, the great high priest. And I guess that's why I especially love this letter, because it speaks not only of what Jesus did long ago, what he said long ago, but that he's doing it now. The letter to the Hebrews says very clearly that Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, has ascended to the Father and continues as priest to offer himself to the Father. And so all of us join to him through faith and baptism. We're all one body with him. We're all, as St. Peter says, a priestly people. You don't just watch a priest at the altar offering, you all are offering, and you're offering yourselves. We priest and victim with Christ, the priest victim. And I think that's why, I guess I've always appreciated this letter to the Hebrews, because it's saying that time and space don't matter with God. Jesus had entered into that eternal mystery of the Father and all through the centuries of human history, he is acting, he is offering himself in the great sacrifice of the cross. And all of us are joined, especially when we celebrate the mystery that is the heart of our Catholic faith, the Mass. We are very conscious that Jesus, our great high priest, is still acting through his priestly people and through those who have been ordained to a certain likeness to Christ to act and speak in his name. We're so very aware of that. Jesus in the Eucharist, our great high priest, leading us week by week, day by day to the Father. And yes, above all, he prays 
that we will be united. I hope you join, whether at home or coming to church, to join in the prayers at the Eucharist, that you realize unity is something that is a burning issue for us Christians. We cannot be satisfied with the divisions. We have to be really convinced this has to end. The disciples of Christ need to be one once more, one in doctrine, one in unity with the one shepherd who is Christ the Lord. God bless you and your family and loved ones.